Now, uh, let's start here in uh, Revelation 19. Hold your place there in Genesis 3. And um, Revelation 19, it mentions, uh, sometimes when you really, really examine the scriptures, every verse, these things are important to us. I, I don't know how anybody else is. When I read something, like if I'm reading a book or something like that, I have a very, very bad habit of skipping a lot of the words in a paragraph, okay? I'm not a speed reader by any means, but sometimes I look for a paragraph and something in that paragraph to jump out at me and then pretend I read the whole paragraph, and I didn't. So sometimes I get lost and I'm going, that didn't make any sense. That's because I didn't read it right. So when it comes to the Bible, though, uh, I like to just slow down, take my time, and, and look at every word, because every word came from our God. Every word came down to us, and there's a meaning in everything that's in the Scripture. God did not waste space in our Bibles. He did not waste that. And he mentions here, uh, specifically, uh, let's start in verse 11. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him. I mean, wh why did it have to be a white horse? Why couldn't it be a purple horse? Pink horse, Okay. It means something. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he's a judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Why does the Bible have to tell you that? It means something. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. You know what that name was? I have no idea. It's, he's, he knows it and nobody else does. Then, then we have another name for him. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. Why do we have to know that? Why is that important? By the way, think about the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. She was, un, she was in her uncleanness for 12 years. Okay? And she had spent all her money on doctors, spent it on probably medicines, whatever, and all for naught. And then she met Jesus. And what did she say to herself? If I can just what? Touch the hem of his garment. Well, look at his garment. It's a vesture dipped in what? It's dipped in blood, okay? And, it's, and it made it white, not red, white. So what is the blood of Jesus? I mean, it, it cleanses, it purifies, it saves, okay? I think all those things are wrapped up in that. And then, um, you know, he, it says that he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, does God wear clothes? Absolutely. That's what your Bible says. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. And here it is. They are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the Bible just, sometimes it just fills your mind with details. And every detail has a significance to it. It has a, has a symbolism behind it. That a symbolism is always going to be explained where? In commentaries, cyclopedias, dictionaries, internet. It's always going to be explained in the Bible. Always. Paul taught us. That when we read the Bible, when we learn something, we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. We see the comparison. We see the similarities. And we always find those in the Bible. Sometimes things just jump out at you. You're reading something and you're going, man, I read that last month or something like that. I know what that means. Sometimes it may take a while. But with me, the finding of these treasures in the Bible is worth the weight, it's always worth the effort. You'll never waste, if you believe the Bible, you'll never waste a minute reading it. Never. It's, God will always, always fill your mind with something. So he mentions here, uh, verse 14, that they were closed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, we're going to have these new, brand new, glorified, perfect bodies. Amen? No diabetes, like you said, no heart disease, no cancer, no aching bones and muscles and, and getting viruses on ships and none of that stuff, okay? Why do we need clothes? Why do we need clothes, okay? 
Well, God has a reason for everything. So I want you to keep that in mind. And let's go back now to Genesis 3. When babies are born, when babies are born, mamas, clothed or unclothed, the phrase is, naked as the day he was born, right? No clothes whatsoever. God even designed us humans different from all the other land creatures that there are in that we have a lack of fur, hair. Most of us do. Okay? God made us that way. He made us unique, but he made us that way for a difference. When he created Adam and Eve, they were, I believe they were fully grown. I believe it was a man and a woman, not a little baby in the garden. Um, but he created them as a baby is born in pure innocence. A child, a small baby, is innocent. It's born innocent. Um, we know at some point, I'm going to bring out a point here in a minute, at some point in a child's mind, they reach an age, you know, we use the phrase age of accountability to describe when a, when a child is born, um, you know, our, our granddaughter died five weeks after birth, okay? And knowing what I know, I was able to, to speak to Lindsay and Antonio and God helping me with this to know that when she drew her last breath here, her first breath in heaven just started. And that, uh, there's no way you talk me out of that. I know what the Bible says. Um, and that, I cling to that. I hold to that. Because the Bible teaches in, a, in two different places about the innocence of children. And when God, uh, when God told Israel back in Numbers 13 and 14, we were dealing with that this morning that they were going to have to wander through the wilderness for 40 years until every one of them died. There was one exception, well, two exceptions, Joshua and Caleb. And then the other exception was the children that were born after they left Egypt were not going to be held accountable for the sins of their parents and any child born in the wilderness was going to get to go in. And God, God used the phrase that they did not know the difference between good and evil. Okay? God is the one who said that. So uh, when David, when King David, when his son was born of Bathsheba, the woman he had the affair with, uh, that child was sick. David mourned the whole time that child was sick. When that child finally died, David got up, cleaned himself, and went and ate. And they questioned him about it. And, and David said, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. And that's two witnesses. They're telling you where a, a young, innocent child goes when they die. They are, uh, we use the difference, the term between saved and safe. They are safe in that they do not have the knowledge of good and evil. They cannot discern that. They're not of that age yet. What age does that start? I'll wait for an answer. Anybody know? You have a clue in your Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So now both of them have transgressed exactly what God said back in Genesis 2, uh, 16 and 17. Okay, God said, don't eat of that fruit of that tree. In the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. So they both did it. They both transgressed. Look at the very next verse. Boom. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They knew it. Before that bite, neither one of them had any knowledge 
of their, of their condition. They were the only two people in the whole world, nobody to compare themselves to, and God had not given them the knowledge of the difference between being naked and being clothed. They were there in the garden. They were just running around. Like you've, all the paintings that you might have seen of Adam and Eve, you know, that's what they were. Don't really know how long they were in the garden uh, up until that time. But the whole time before Genesis 3, they were completely naked. Okay? When they transgressed, they did it knowingly, did they not? They both... Adam knew what God said. Eve knew what God said, because I think Adam told her. She believed the devil's lie. She was tempted, drawn into that temptation, transgressed. Adam did likewise. And immediately upon doing that, they both recognized that they were naked. And the first thing they did, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, I was mentioning that this morning. Their attempt to cover up their own shame, God would not accept. If you look at um, verse, uh, let's see here. Well, they, we know that in verse 8, they hid themselves from God. In verse 10, he, this is Adam. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. In verse 11, and he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Now, God already knows the answer to that question. He saw it. He knew it. He foreknew it. But he's bringing this dialogue because he's going to teach us something. He's going to tell Adam something. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? His transgression made him aware of his nakedness. And nakedness, God has put it in us. It is in our nature. When I, when I say it's in our nature, it's, I think it's written in our DNA. Who we are, what we are. How we respond to things are written down in the book that God gave every one of us. The book of our members, the book of our body. And it, there is something in the DNA code somewhere that causes us to desire to have parts of our body covered up. It is against nature. It is against our DNA. Nobody, nobody had to teach me as a child to cover up. I'm 11 years old. I don't have to have somebody telling me I can't go outside naked. Okay? I know it. I don't want anybody to see that. Okay? That's in our nature. It is a defilement of that nature to unclothe the human body. Can I get an amen? I got a story. I got a story. I was going to tell it this morning. Just, God didn't want it fit in, but it fits now. The first island we went to was the island of St. Martin. It's one of those Caribbean islands, not too far from Puerto Rico. And it's divided in half. There's a Dutch side and a French side. And last, I think it was September, Hurricane Irma slammed into that island at 250 miles. It was a Category 5 plus hurricane they don't have a category beyond five it was stronger than a five 250 mile an hour force wind that's the equivalent of a car driving 250 miles an hour and hitting something the lady that was driving us around that island showing us everything the island is just destroyed she said every leaf on every tree was gone just like that the diving guy on board the ship, I was talking to him, and he said, the snorkelers are telling us there's no fish. The coral has been destroyed. I mean, that just tore that place to pieces, okay? On the French side, which is sort of the northern eastern part of the island, I won't say anything about the French, but... Their morals in France are not like ours in America, are used to be morals in America. There was, on the northeast side of that island, a huge nudist colony. Yeah, ugh, okay? And pe people all over the world, rich people, Europeans, whoever, like to go there and just... And they got little bungalows they stay in, and I mean, everything. 
And she drove us by that, and she was telling us about it. Okay? And now the rest of the islands that were south of that we visited, they weren't, they weren't hit too bad. But St. Martin was different. And I had it in my mind that God, that nudist colony is gone. Every building destroyed. Everything they had standing up there, gone. Trees, gone. F waters just running all over the place. I mean, it just destroyed it. I, I see God in that. God destroyed that wickedness. Amen? It's wicked to want to disrobe yourself in the sight of somebody that's not supposed to see that. Amen? That's wrong, that's wicked. I don't care what the rest of the world does. I don't care what tribe there is somewhere where they don't wear any clothes. That matters nothing to me. God put it in us to cover up. Okay? It's a defilement of nature not to do that. And when she told me about that, I mean, I just, I saw it on the map. I knew where it was. God slammed that nudist colony with a 250 mile an hour hurricane, whirlwind. When you sow to the flesh, what do you get? You reap the whirlwind, okay? And I'm telling you, it is a violation of the nature that God put in every human being, lost or saved, to be found naked, okay? Now, think about it, okay? How old's Bub? Three, okay? Um, I'm not going to get weird or anything like that, but he probably is at the age where jumping out of the bathtub and running through the house is no big deal to him. Like giving the puppy a bath and he just runs all through the house, right? Okay? At some point, that's going to change in him. You're not going to have to teach it to him. Okay? At some point, his mind is going to develop. And something is going to click in in him that when he comes out of the bathroom... He's going to have something on. Okay? It's natural. It's nature. Every child, every human goes through a stage in their young life where they get to a point and now all of a sudden they understand that they're not wearing any clothes and it's, I'm not going out there. Okay? You don't have to lock them in. You don't have to anything. They just know it. They become aware of it. I think that it's at that time that they've come to the part in life where they can understand the difference between good, which brings joy, and evil, which brings shame. So does nakedness. Remember, the first thing, Adam and Eve were born innocent in the Garden of Eden and had access to the Tree of Life. But the moment that they ate of that fruit immediately they understood the shame of being naked they understood it they knew it and they went to cover themselves up if you look at um, same chapter here in verse uh, let's see here verse verse 21 unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. God was not going to accept their own covering of their shame. He was not accepting it. God, and they use, they use fig leaves or, you know, that's what the Bible says, so I, that's what I believe. But God took an animal, slew it, skinned it, and made them a covering of an animal that was innocent. Animal, we don't hold animals guilty in courts for doing wrong deeds. I mean, we may have to put them down, but they don't know, the animals don't know the difference between right and wrong. Animals don't have morality. Animals don't make decisions of, I shouldn't do that, that's bad, I can't, whatever. That's, that's their nature. And the whole idea of animal sacrifices, I think, in the Old Testament was God was taking something that was innocent and causing it to pay the penalty for the sins of the guilty. Christ being the lamb who was innocent, having to atone for the sins of the guilty. Does that make sense to everybody? 
So here is God covering the guilty with the covering of the innocent. If that makes sense to everybody. Because that's, that's, what we, that's what, how we see this idea of salvation and how it, how it goes along with uh, the issue of clothes. Now, um, let's see here. Where was I going to pick this up at? Turn to 2 Corinthians. While you're turning there, I'll, I'll mention something. When I, was in, uh, when I was in Bible college, you know, us students would have these little talks back and forth. You know, we're trying to f- figure some things out and just exploring ideas and so on and wondering about, you know, what's right. You know, this is what we were taught, but what's really right, what's really wrong and so on. And, and issues like how a Christian should dress. I mean, those issues always came up. There was a lot of different opinions. There was, uh, I am fairly conservative. I was around students that weren't. And, um, you know, I was taught that there's just a way that as Christians, when we dress, we dress certain ways. The Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches women to be modest, to be shamefaced. That doesn't mean ashamed of who you are. It means have the decency to cover yourself in a modest fashion that does not draw attention to the body. Does that make sense? Okay. I can't describe for you every stitch of clothing that shows up at JCPenney and whether it's modest or indecent. Not going to get into that. But I think when you love the Lord and you read his word and you believe what it says, God directs you. God shows you this, this not right. This is not, this not how I want you to be. There are some Christians who say that it's not right for women to have jewelry or, you know, fix their hair certain ways or wear any makeup. I don't agree with that. I think in Ezekiel, what is it? Ezekiel 16, God clothed Jerusalem and he adorned her. He gave her jewels and he gave her nice stuff to wear. And I mean, he fixed her up good. Guys, remember that now. Okay. Take care of her. Buy her some nice things to wear. Okay. But uh, anyway, so I think the Bible covers that issue. Uh, Let me throw this in. What about the legs? Do you think all of the legs should be covered on a man or a woman? Where's the, where's the line? You're right. You're right. And there's two places in the Bible to show you that. Number one, when God, in Exodus, when God gave the instructions for building the tabernacle and putting the, the uniform on the high priest, God specifically designed the, the headpiece that was to be worn. He designed every part of it. God designed the breastplate that Aaron the high priest was to wear, what jewels went where, what names went to where. And then God said, make, make him a pair of linen breeches that covered from the hip down to the knee to cover the thigh. And God specifically said, so that his nakedness does not appear. Then, in, um, it's in Isaiah, I can't remember what chapter, but God is talking about the the virgin daughter of Babylon. And he describes how she uncovers her thigh and shows her nakedness. So there's two witnesses in the Bible. Okay? If you're going to wear short breeches, cutoffs, or whatever, cover the knee. Go from here, cover the knee. That's what God said. Does that make sense? Okay? Anyway. 2 Corinthians 5, because summer's coming. And you don't need to be wearing nothing with writing on your backside. (laughs) Guys or gals. Amen. Amen. If it's tight, don't wear it. Man or woman. Man or woman. Cover it up. Cover your body. 
Okay? Cover it up. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 1. For we know, this is how God describes our salvation and what he's going to promise us. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what's he talking about? This church building? He's talking about our body. And it, 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 it dissolves, doesn't it? It dissolves and turns into what? A body that's not, uh, that's not embalmed. You bury that thing in the ground, come back 300 years later, what are you going to find? You don't find anything. It dissolves. It turns back literally into the dust that God made us from. Okay? Our body is full of minerals that come from the ground. Okay? And for every color of human being, there's every color of dirt that matches. Think about it. There's white dirt and real dark dirt and red dirt and kind of in-between dirt. And that's how many different types of people there are. But we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan. How many of you wake up some mornings and groan? Amen. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. See what our desire is? Our desire is to be clothed upon. Not found naked. To be clothed. To be covered up. Our earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found how? Naked. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but have you ever had the naked dream? Okay? That's, I hate that dream. Okay? And that's because it's in our nature to want to be covered up. You know what sin does to a person's mind? It begins to defile its own nature. And the deeper people get into sin, the more clothes start coming off. They were telling us, these Caribbean islands, they do what a lot of other countries do this time of year. They have some big, wild, drunken carnival. And it, it never occurred to me, who's ever heard of carnival? If you go to Brazil, at... Uh, well, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is a version of Carnival. In Brazil, it's huge. Places in Europe, it's huge. And they have drunken, fornicating women, nearly undressed or totally undressed or whatever, parading through the streets, and they do this for days. And it never occurred to me until we were driving around, the word Carnival has the word carnal, carnal which means flesh in it. And that's what it is. Carnival in these countries is nothing more than abusing the flesh and getting the desires of the flesh. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? And in these places where they do that, you will see nearly or totally undressed people. In public, in the streets. You know why? They have no Holy Spirit. Their sin has destroyed their very nature. Okay? Don't go to a gay pride parade. Don't take your kids to a gay pride parade. If you don't want to see it, don't go. Because that's what they do. These, I don't know how they get away with it in America. But they parade in streets in certain cities of this country doing the vilest things publicly, not a word is said. Nobody gets arrested, nothing happens. That's because the nature starts getting defiled and being found naked does not bother them at all. Okay? That's getting close to having a conscience that's seared with a hot iron. Meaning, nothing, nothing bothers them anymore. They, de they, they declare their sin as Sodom, the Bible says. They hide it not. Amen? I mean, it was in Adam and Eve's nature to hide from the presence of God. People get to such a condition in their life with sin that they have no problem 
declaring and showing forth their sin in the face of God. Does that make sense to everybody? This is why sin is so dangerous. It's so deadly. It's because it eats away at our very fabric of how God... God designed our psychology, not Sigmund Freud. Okay? God understands us better than anybody does because He designed us and He knows how we work. And He knows what sin and how it destroys the morality d decisions that we make. Sin destroys that. And people just go around just doing whatever they want to, however they want to. Okay? So, verse uh, 2 again. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we should not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Think of gravity. Gravity is a burden, is it not? Okay. How much weight did you gain, Sterling? About five pounds in one week on cruise food. It can be done. Okay. <laughs> That's being burdened, amen. Not for, watch this, look at, look at that verse. Not for that we would be unclothed. We're not longing to leave this earth so we can shed our clothes and be in heaven naked. That's not what we want. But clothed upon. Notice the phrasing here. Clothed upon. Does that mean that we did it ourselves? Or somebody did it for us? Be but clothed upon. It means someone put it on us. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Think about clothes. Think about if you had a long one-piece robe. Okay? Which end do you put your head in first? The big end. Right? Not the little skinny head hole in. You start with the big end and think about that. Think of the open end of a big long linen robe like a big mouth. And what's it doing when it comes over your body? It is swallowing up mortality. Isn't that neat? But clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. That almost exact same phrase, 1 Corinthians 15, death is Swallowed up in victory. That's your victory garment that God's putting on you. Amen? And once you are wearing that, that signifies no more death, no more mortality, no more sin, no more shame, because those clothes are permanent. Permanent pressed. Never to be washed. Never need to be washed. They've already been washed. Amen? Amen? Oh, I like it. Luke, Luke chapter 8. Look at this. Luke chapter 8. Turn there. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I'm not going to keep you till 6 o'clock tonight. Be 7. Luke 8. There was a man in, uh, this starts in verse 26, the, the country of the Gadarenes. There was a certain man, verse 27, when he went forth to the land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time. And what, ha what was, what, when he was full of devils, what? What do you think about that? Isn't that true? Isn't that true? I'm telling you, sin and devils always go hand in hand. The more sin you get into, the more devils are going to climb all over you. Okay? And they erode morality. Think about you guys that are older than me. I'm not saying anybody, but there was a time that you may remember that women did not go out of their house dressed like women go out of their house dressed today. You remember those days? Okay. They did not wear halter tops, tube tops, short shorts. I mean... I'm not going anyway. They did not even anywhere near it. Okay? That was 30s, 40s, 50s. The 60s changed it. Everything changed.
okay? A lot of things happened in the 60s. Our whole country transformed in a matter of 10 years' time. A lot of it by the influence of media. Never before seen in human history is what media has done to human civilization all over the world. It's everywhere. But it eroded morality. And women and men both now unrobing, taking clothes off, walking around in ways immodest and ungodly, even if they were lost, they covered up. That was in human nature. It doesn't take a saved person to know how to dress right. Amen? It's in their nature. And things changed in this country. And except the Lord Jesus come, I don't see them going backward anytime soon. Okay? What a shame that is. Okay? But our nation, I believe, is full of devils. And our nation is naked before God. And wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Now look at verse 35. When he met Jesus, guess what happened? Verse 35, then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. What's the next word? Who told him to put clothes on? Nobody. Nobody. You don't see that. You don't say, see Jesus going, devils be gone. Would you put some clothes? Good grief. Would you put some clothes on? Automatically, the devils are gone. His nature is back. He knows he's naked. He knows he's not right. The first thing he does, get closed. Okay? And, and, and remember the symbolism of this. Now turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is about the covering of righteousness. I guess that's what I'll call that. Help me remember that title, Courtney. The covering of righteousness. Matthew 25. Let me tell you the ministry of the local church, one of the ministries of the local church associated with this. Look at verse 34. This is the separation of the sheep and the goats. The, um, the sheep, verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the king, and prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Verse 36, look at it. Naked, and ye clothe me. This is the ministry of the sheep. Okay? I was uh, sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we uh, thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And you think about that. The role that the sheep, the body-believing members of Jesus Christ here on this earth is to bring clothing to those that are naked, which means to show them the covering of righteousness over the shame of their sins. Somebody say amen. Think about those DVDs. Think about what God has given us here in this church to be able to reach out from beyond these four walls. Okay? The microphones, the cameras, the internet, the goofy, stupid stuff I say every now and then, make people laugh, and all of that stuff... But I'm going to give scripture. I'm going to give them the word of God. And the word of God will go to the people's minds and their hearts. And it will begin to, sh be begin to restore the nature that God put in us to want to be clothed. Okay? Who in here is perfect? Nobody. Who wants to be? If you, if you could make, if you could snap your fingers, turn around three times and say, I'm never going to sin again ever and then make that happen, who would do it right now? I want to see that, Sterling. Stand up. No. Just... Yeah. It wouldn't work. But if we could have, if we could have, we would have done it already. 
we would have done it already. Because the nature that God has put in us goes along with what Adam and Eve happened with them is that we desire to be clothed in righteousness. I don't want to sin ever again. I don't want to hurt anybody ever again another day in my life. Sin hurts people, doesn't it? I don't want to make another mistake. I don't want to say something stupid ever again. I don't, I don't want that ever. One of these days, I know that this is coming off and I'm going to be clothed with righteousness. But I desire it every day. I want it. Okay? Because to cover the shame of things I've said, things I've done, things I've thought, to cover that shame, I desire to be clothed upon. And I think, I think there's still people going up down the street in our county, in the state of Missouri, in the United States, in Kenya, wherever it is that we're reaching, I think there's still people out there who are ashamed and they want to be clothed. And our job is when we see those who are naked, we don't mock them. We don't throw assaults, verbal assaults at them. We're not, trying to make, we're not trying to humiliate them further. They're already humiliated over what they've done. They're already naked. You don't strip somebody naked that's already naked. What we want to do is to bring them the clothing of righteousness that Jesus can cover up their shame with, just like he's done with us. We know what we've done with our lives, haven't we? We know what we did. But we have a new knowledge now, a new conscience that says, I know what I did, but I also know that Christ has covered me with his righteousness, of which I am undeserving. Father in heaven, teach us, teach us more. Lord, what you've shown us tonight is great. It's absolutely fundamental to understanding Christianity, to understanding the grace that you give us, to understanding the difference between sin and righteousness, between being found naked and clothed. Father, we, just, we thank you, God, for eternity, for swallowing up our mortality with life, for swallowing up our transgressions with righteousness, for covering our shame with holiness. We thank you for these things, God. We could not have done it ourselves. So, Father, help us, Lord, as a little church. Use us however you want to. If, if between now and the time you come, we only reach one more person, it'll mean everything to that one person. Lord, help us to reach people with that ministry of the sheep to find those that are naked and ashamed, those that want the clothing of righteousness and offer it to them. Give them that chance. Thank you, dear God, for meeting with us tonight, for helping us along in our journey. We love you. We'll serve you forever. And we pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.